Okay, so we are still in the Gospel of John, and I'll be honest, I stopped writing Mr. Scott up here at the top because I was feeling really shameful of myself after some of these lessons. Um, but we're, we're still in the Gospel of John. Last week, we finished up a um, lesson about this man who comes, uh, this official who comes to Jesus for help, and that's up in the city of Cana in Galilee. And y'all are sick and tired, I know, of me drawing this map. But here's this C. Which C is this? It's pop quiz time. Y'all got to have this map memorized by now. Galilee. The Sea of Galilee. Good. And then out of that comes a river. And what river is that? Jordan River. The River Jordan. Good. That's sort of where we started uh, at Bethany on the Jordan River um, with John the Baptist. That's where we started then. You know, Jesus goes up into Galilee to Cana, where he performed the first sign, turning the water into wine. Um, Capernaum came up last week again. That's where the official whose son he healed uh, was. We did have spent some time in Samaria. That's where we met the woman at the well. Samaria has these mountain ranges here that sort of restrict travel unless you go right through it. Um, and then down here is Judea. And we're back in Judea today. Uh, it's interesting to me that we're, we're sort of, we're just going around and around here in sort of a circle. We're back in the city called Jerusalem, and we're going to start reading in John chapter 5, uh, and we're going to read verses 1 through 18, and I see four of us, um, so we'll just sort of split it up this way. Um, Matt, if you'll read verses 1 through uh, 5. And Alyssa, if you'll read 6 through 10. And Katie, if you'll read John chapter 5, we're on page 890, um, verses, what did I say? Verses 11 through 15, and then I'll read to the end of 18. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. And he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was for, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was early. Go ahead. <laughs> the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered him, My father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So this has always been an interesting situation to me. Um, there's, there's some things in this passage that I've always kind of scratched my head, like, why, why did it go down this way? Um, so let's just start at the top. In verse, in verse 1, it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. Now, it doesn't specify which, which feast, but we've already seen one feast that Jesus has, attend, ha, ha, has attended, and, and what was that? Passover feast? That was the Passover. And there are um, a few others. 
and, and it doesn't specify, but most um, commentators say this was most likely the Passover, which, which means that we've been in the Gospel of John so far, in John chapter 3, 2 and 3, really, he was in Jerusalem for the Passover. Um, and then in a, you know, in a short few weeks, he ends up back in Galilee. And then it's almost like we fast forwarded most of a year. It's back at Passover time. Um, and uh, just as a quick reminder, Passover is the feast in which the Jews celebrate their exodus from Egypt. Um, when they were enslaved in Egypt, uh, God sent Moses to rescue them and uh, put on the Egyptians a series of ten plagues, the last of which was the plague of the angel of death, who would come and kill the firstborn and each family. And in order for the Israelites not to be afflicted by that plague, when the angel of death came through, they were to paint um, the blood of a lamb on the doorposts and the lintel of their door. And when the angel just saw that, he passed over their house. And so they celebrate this event in a feast commanded by God in Scripture to uh, represent what happened. And every element, ultimately, of the Passover points to, to Christ. If you ever meet a, um, a, a Jewish Christian, somebody who grew up celebrating these things, and then later they come to know Christ as their Savior, they look back on this Passover and go, man, it's really beautiful to see the symbolism of each element of that, pointing to Christ um, as our Savior. And so here, I would say this is most likely the Passover feast. He's now back in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And there's this, ge geographically wise, I'm going to draw this terrible blob of a picture that's Jerusalem, okay? And there were gates all around Jerusalem like this. And one of the gates was called the Sheep Gate. And it was called the Sheep Gate because that's where the sheep went in and out. And in those days, uh, the city was in here. The farm was out here. So out here were the animals and out here were the, uh, the crops. And so it was sort of like uh, the fortified city was where the people would live, and that way if someone came and marauders came to attack, then people could all fit inside the gates. And then the surrounding land around it was animals and farmland. This place is called the Sheep Gate. And um, nearby the Sheep Gate, it said there was this pool. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this bigger. There was this pool and a colonnade. So here's sort of the pool with water in it. And there's a colonnade with shade, like this. And so you can, you can imagine posts like this. And there's, um, there's these kinds of things that you can lay under to, to, to stay out from in the sun. And the reason why the colonnade was built there was to protect the many who came and sat around this pool. Now, who came and sat around this pool? What does it say? Invalids. People who were disabled in some way. Sure. Invalids. Uh, give some examples. Uh, so that some were blind. Uh, some were lame. Some were paralyzed, which in the Greek is, is, is really easy to read. It says paralyticos. And I went, hey, I know what that word means. Um, and look closely at that verse. Okay, that's verse three. I want you to be looking at it. And then look at the very next verse, because no, nobody read it. So I know your Bible looks a lot like mine. That's verse three, and right after it is verse five. Where's verse four? Do you all have a footnote or anything? What does the footnote say? Mine says, from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. Very good. Now, uh, in, in a lot of modern translations, that verse is moved down to the footnotes. That's because there are many manuscripts that don't include that verse. When we talk about where we get our scriptures from, they weren't written originally in English. They were written in Hebrew for the Old Testament, Greek for the New Testament. Uh, with the exception of maybe Matthew that may have been written in Hebrew first and then translated into Greek um, by Matthew himself. Well, um, 
this is one of those places where as the scriptures were copied and, and copied and copied and copied, some of the older manuscripts that we have include that verse. And if you read like a King James version, it'll have it in there. And then some of the manuscripts, the original source text we see, don't have it in there. Well, what do we do with that? Well, one of the things that we, we notice is that whether or not that verse is in there doesn't actually change any of the spiritual doctrine that we learn from Scripture. And so um, we're actually, the, the number of source texts that we have pointing to the concrete things that, are, that we take as truths away from Scripture give us great confidence even though there are some small differences here in the originals, um, that we still hold a very real copy of the original text. But I like that it's at least included in the footnotes because it gives us a lot of context for this story. Why were these people all around the pool? And why is this man talking about, when Jesus asked him a question, why does he say, nobody can help me into the pool? Well, what is that? What's that got to do with anything? And it's hidden down here in this verse four that's been pulled down to the footnotes. That, it, that there was an angel of the Lord that came down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the waters up. The waters would move uh, in a supernatural way. And when that happened, somebody would come down, and God used that as an opportunity to heal somebody who got down to the water first. Um, why, why does God do things like this? He does all kinds of things. <laughs> this is a gracious thing. But it's a, it's a way to set up here the story for us. There are a multitude of people lying under this colonnade, which looks like scribble scrabble now that I look at it. Uh, but imagine, you know, like, like maybe you go to the beach and there's a pool and there's some shaded areas around the pool for you to sit under. That's kind of what it looks like. And so when Jesus walks up onto the scene, he sees not everybody there. He goes to one specific person. There's a man there. And that man has been an invalid for how long? 38 years. 38 years. That's a really long time. Uh, it, it's not like he got sick a few days ago and came and sat down here. This man has been lame for 38 years. And he doesn't have anybody to help him. He's been sitting out here for that long trying to be healed, wanting to be healed. But whenever this supernatural event happened, he can't get down into the water fast enough. And so he waits. And that's who Jesus focuses attention on. He then approaches him, and it says in verse 6, it says, he saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time. Now, Jesus has been coming to Jerusalem for a long time. This man's been lame for 38 years. It's likely he's seen this man before. He knows, and everybody around there knows that this man has been lame for 38 years. And he asks him a question. Alyssa, reread for us the question that he asks him. He says, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? My translation says, do you want to be healed? What? What a weird question. The man's been sitting there for how long? He's been lame for how long? And Jesus says, do you even want to be healed? Why did he ask him that question? And I've never really got the answer until I read one commentator this week, and he said, because it, it, it forced the man to consider his condition and yearn even more for the cure. I mean, it really does. I, like, hey, I could just walk up and talk to a lame man, and we could talk about politics. We could talk about sports. We wouldn't talk very long. I don't know a lot about sports. But we could talk about all kinds of things. But if I walk up to a man like that and say, do you want to be healed? Well, it's now in the forefront of his mind. And he comes right out and says it. He says, he says yes, sir. I, but it's sort of like a yes, but answer. I, I mean, I do, but I, I don't have anybody to help me get down there. And even while we're standing here, this man doesn't know who Jesus is. He doesn't know the power of the man who's talking to him. And, and so he's, he's thinking, you know, uh, he's just asking me because of the, this pool. And the waters aren't moving, so I can't really ask you to help me get down there. And I don't know when it's going to happen, but you're probably not going to be here. And I don't have somebody to be with me all the time. 
And so Jesus does what he does so well. He heals the man with just a word. In verse 8, Jesus says to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. Now, he doesn't just say, well, you're well now. It, it, so, like, if we flip back to the previous chapter, he says to the man who came to see him, whose son was ill, he just says, go, your son will live. And here he could have just told the man, get up. He could have just said, you know, oh, you're, you're well now. But he actually makes the man do something to prove it. And he's not even just a little bit healed. This is a lame man. He, he can't have even just sort of like crawled in a slightly upright position. He said, pick your bed up and carry it away from here. Well, somebody that's been lame for 38 years, that's quite a feat. And if we remember the context here, what day did he do this on? On the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath. What are you not supposed to be doing on the Sabbath? Working. Working. In fact, there are places in the Old Testament where it clarifies and says, it says don't carry burdens. Now, at, the point could be made that in those passages that was talking specifically about doing the work of like your occupation or working exceptionally hard. You're not actually resting. But here he, he tells this guy, look, pick up your bed and walk off with it. Well, this is an instant, an instantly noticeable thing. Here's a man who's been laying for this long. He picks up his bed, and here, I'm going to draw him. He's, he's been lying here like this next to the pool, lame, all right? And he looks like a mermaid. He needs one more feet. Okay. He's been laying here next to the pool on his mat. So the beds back then, they weren't, you know, it's not like I picked up my bed, right? Okay. Imagine more like a really flat mat that you can roll up, but it's got a little bit of padding to it. You could just roll it, tuck it under your arm, All right? Even that, like that's not a lot of weight, but it's something. And he's immediately noticed. In verse 10, it says, the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. What made you think you could start walking around doing this? Don't you know the law? When Jesus asked him to pick up his bed, not just to prove to him that he was healed, but also to draw immediate attention from those around him that a miracle had taken place. He's proving that a miracle had taken place to those who were watching. Well, this isn't uh, the only time that he does this. When he turns the water into wine, what does he tell the servants to do? What do you all remember? Go draw water. Go draw the water and do what with it? Take it to the master. Take it to the master of the feast. Take it to somebody who would notice that this is the best wine that's been served at this celebration. It's an obvious miracle. And so here, Jesus didn't pick somebody who'd been sick for a few days. He's been laying for 38 years. He, and he didn't just say, okay, you're healed. You know, later on, when you feel like it, get up and walk off. You can leave your bed here. He says, pick up your mat on the Sabbath and walk off with it so everybody notices that a lame man of 38 years has been healed. And they do. They notice it immediately. But the Jews really pick up on this fact that he is doing work on the Sabbath. And what is his response? They say, you know, why are you doing this? And what does he say in verse 11? Why is he doing it? He says, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. Good. <laughs> because he told me to. He, he, he's blaming the man. Now, it also says in a, in a little bit that he didn't know who it was because Jesus healed the man, told him to take up his bed and walk, and then just slipped away because of the crowd. And so here he was referring to the man. And it may be easy for us to guess that if he's thinking, wow, this man has healed me. This must be a very good man. This must be a man of God, that God is with him to do this. And if he's the one that told me to take up my bed on the Sabbath and walk off with it, I guess it's okay. I mean, because if he's a good man and God sent him, he wouldn't have told me to sin on the Sabbath, right? And so he does that. And, and this, this also brings to 
remembrance that there's multiple occasions we see in the Gospels that Jesus makes the point that the Sabbath was not made for man, the Sabbath was made for God. Ultimately, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, uh, that it's about him. It's about worshiping him. It's not about us following minute, detailed laws. Uh, the law is very important, and following the law to please God is extremely important, but uh, the Sabbath was not made for us. The Sabbath was made to bring glory and honor to him. So um, they, <laughs> they don't like that answer because they didn't, it, it's sort of like, well, this guy told you wrong. All right, now tell us who that is. All right, we need to, we need to go have a conversation with that guy. Um, they say in verse 12, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? And he doesn't know, so he can't answer them. So let's see, Katie, can you reread for me verses 14 and 15? Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Good. So this man, you know, now he knows this man is Jesus. And Jesus comes up to him sort of to finish the job because Jesus isn't there just to perform this sign of healing. Uh, not only does he have the power over time, this man was so, uh, it had been lame for so long that it was obvious he was not going to get better on his own naturally. This is an obvious supernatural sign of Jesus's divine power. But he has now healed a man, and we can gather from his, his command to the man when he catches up with him in the temple. By the way, the man goes to the temple. He's just been healed, and what's one of the first places that he goes to? He goes to the temple to give God praise and thanksgiving. And that's where Jesus finds him. And he walks up, and he says this phrase. He says, sin no more. In other words, this lameness was very likely a punishment for sins that he had committed. Now, that does not mean that every sin that we commit will be punished by physical things. Um, ultimately, God reserves the judgment and punishment of sins until judgment day. Um, but frequently, in order to get our attention and in order to bring glory to himself, he allows these punishments and, and sends these punishments for sin and this was a sin that resulted in 38 years of lameness. And Jesus says, look, you're well now. Don't go back to where you were before. And that's a challenge to us too. I mean, I've, I, I'm saved, and I've been saved out of the depths of sin. And the challenge there for me is, I'm well now. Don't go back to that sin before. I've been saved from that. I've been rescued from that. Uh, I'm, I'm talking like deep addictions that I've been rescued out of, and we can get into that in another lesson. Um, but the, the, the grace of Christ portrayed in me when I return to those sins grieves the Holy Spirit as a result. And so just as he's challenging this man, sin no more. That's the challenge for those of us, those of you who are believers, who have been saved, um, to do that, to, to, to lean on the power of the Spirit, as Alyssa mentioned earlier in this call, um, to do those things that bear fruit, to do the good works prepared beforehand for us to do and not return to the sins that we were called out of. So the man's response to that, it says he, he went away and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Now it doesn't say that he told them it was Jesus who told me to take up my man and walk. But he has already told them, the man who healed me told me that, and he's just going to leave it up to them to remember that and, and decide that Jesus is out there telling people to do work on the Sabbath. But he doesn't want to actually like tell them, oh, Jesus is the one who told me to do work on the Sabbath. Well, they, they obviously understand the insinuation. In verse 16, it says, this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And then Jesus gets in even more trouble. Now, A, he's in trouble for healing on the Sabbath. He's in trouble for telling a man to take up his bed and walk on the Sabbath. And then he makes them really, really mad. 
In verse 17, it says, But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. Well, let's think about that. Let's look all the way back to Genesis. How many days did it take to create everything that exists, the entire world? How many days? Six days. It took six days. All right. So these, I'm just going to draw it like this. It took six days to create the earth and everything that exists. And then what happened on the seventh day? God rested. God rested. This is the day that he calls a Sabbath or a rest. Did God stop working? Did he rest on the seventh day and then just sit down on his throne and everything is just going to keep going on and I'm not going to get involved? Is he, did he stop working? It depends on what you mean. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, he, he is active. He remains involved in his creation. Good. So I think what you're getting at, yeah, he's not, uh, he is not an isolated far off God that no longer does anything in his creation. Right. So here, these were, this was his work of creating. Well, he's not in the business of creating anymore. He created and then he rested, but he continues to, uh, through his providence and through his sovereignty, he still rules over and works actively in history for the redemption of his people and the, um, the, the oversight of everything that happens. I mean, when we talk about the providence of God, it's not just, well, God, you know, helped me get good grades on my test today and helped me remember things, or, you know, God uh, helped me get all my work done today, or you know, I, I found a hundred dollar bill underneath the couch cushion. Those are God's providence, but it's so much more than that. When we see him as he works in history to ordain what happens to accomplish his purposes, that's God's providence. And that is why Jesus says that he, my father is, look at your Bible, it's present tense, is working not was working, not has worked, not will be working. He is working now. This is an all the time thing. And then Jesus says, and I am working. Wow. So he's just called God his father. He's corrected them on their understanding of how the Sabbath works. And he's claimed that he is equal with God. And now they're upset. Look at verse 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Now, that's pretty mad. Not just uh, excommunicate him from the synagogue, not just try and shut down his discipling activities, not go and picket outside of his daddy's carpenter shop, none of that. They sought to kill him as a result. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, we know that he's telling the truth here, and that's what this whole gospel is about. Ultimately, the gospel of John was written so that you and I might read these things and believe that he is the Son of God, and that by believing, we might have life in his name. And so this little exchange is going to continue over the next few weeks of lessons. We're going to read uh, some long passages here of just Jesus talking to them and explaining this stuff. So we'll, we'll get into those um, in the next couple of weeks. But that's what, that's what it's all about. Is he, he, ultimately, this sign was a setup for him to be able to make this one claim. Here, I've, I've, I've given you now a sign that proves uh, of my divine origin. And now I'm going to make this claim that I'm the son of the father, the one that you call the one and only God. Um, and they're going to get mad about that. And he's going to use it as a teaching opportunity because he's Jesus. So. Um, can I ask a question about verse 14? Sure. 
Um, so, okay, when Jesus says to him, see, you are well again, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. That made me think about um, the fact that before, before um, we even have the ability to look on Christ as our Savior, we're completely dead in sin. And we don't even have the ability on our own without the grace of God to stop sinning. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, would you say that that's true? I'm, I'm, I'm like not making a claim here. I'm asking a question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah. I would say that that's true. Um, yeah. That, that we are, uh, one of the ways to put that is that we're morally enable. So uh, theologians make a distinction between um, like the, the, uh, the ability to choose. There's sort of like this right. inherent ability to choose. You can choose right and wrong, but you, you're morally unable to choose anything other than wrong because there's something wrong on the inside. Right. It has to do with our, our wants. So mm -hmm. for example, when we talk, a lot of times the phrase that comes up here, so you won't find it in scripture, but it comes up in these conversations, is the phrase free will. And mm -hmm. I'm, I've never found anybody that, would disagree to defining free will as being able to do whatever I want. That's how we think of it. I, I want to do whatever I want. Well, when the Bible talks about our fallen nature uh, as being darkened by sin, as being cursed by sin, that, that means that our wants are what's actually broken. So you can still do whatever you want, but the only things you ever want to do are sinful. Mm -hmm. So you can't choose any other thing. Yeah. So I think um, here, would you say that, and I feel like this is true in other places where Jesus um, does a healing miracle, that he heals the person completely, meaning not only does he heal them physically, but he, you know, he heals them 100%, like totally and completely, basically um, opens their eyes to see him. And so would you say that, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is the whole stop sinning thing um, I think that it shouldn't be read as in your own power and in right. your, you know, you see what I'm saying? That's good. That's a good point. Um, you know, each time we've seen one of these signs, one of these miracles in the gospel of John, the end result of that is always belief. It's always somebody turning and putting their faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. And here, um, though the Jews who heard about this, um, and were upset, did not turn and believe in Christ, but this man does. And we see mm -hmm. that even in his response, he doesn't know that it was Jesus who did it, but where does he go when he's healed? He goes straight to the temple to provide mm -hmm. um, gifts and offerings to the Lord as thanksgiving for the healing that's happened to him. And then Jesus comes back and says, oh, by the way, hey, I'm Jesus. <laughs> and you can believe on my name. Mm -hmm. And, and, now go and sin no more. And so you're right. I mean, this would not have been a um, go and sin no more, you know, and, and try to be a better person. That's not what this is. Be a better person so God won't smite you again. That's not what this is. It's um, out of gratitude for the healing that's been done within you and uh, what's happened in your heart in mm -hmm. response to that, go and sin no more. I thought it was also interesting related to that gratitude point earlier on when Jesus tells him to pick up his bed and walk and, and he probably knows it's the Sabbath and, and probably knows that it's against the law, but that's an example or an illustration, I guess, of how our response should be out of gratitude when somebody does something even small for us. And even if it's not healing, uh, if we've been lame for 38 years or even bigger, if we've been dead in our sin for our whole lives. We have an automatic or should have an automatic impulse to, to obey that person. Like, I want to do something for you. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to question if you just healed my lameness of 38 years, I'm not going to question if you can say, pick up your bed and go walk. Okay. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to oblige you. I'll bend the rule. <laughs> yeah. But it's kind of the same, like you're saying, it's that same uh, or a small illustration of that proper response. And the sin no more thing is something that I, I find that I can, I personally get discouraged at times by the fact that repeatedly uh, throughout the new testament we see these commands stop sinning uh, mm -hmm. are you are you going to return to your sin no cut that out and it's easy at least for me to get into um an incorrect and a, and a dark mindset of well i 
see sin every day. And there are some sins that I go, I struggle with and fall back into every day. Does that mean I am not saved? Does it mean that I, you know, you can go down this path, but I think like you were saying, it's ultimately, well, there are two, two things here. A, it's not my effort that's saving me. Like I, I cannot just say, oh, all right, no more sin. Not a problem. I'll just, uh, I'll just obey then from now on. It's not within my ability. It's a process of sanctification. And B, it, it, you can look at it in the, on the flip side and say in this process that if you are concerned about it and you're seeing this uh, and, and it bothers you, then that in and of itself can be one of the, the signs of assurance that God gives us because if God has, has left you to, to be a reprobate and, and left you to your sin, then you're not going to be sorry about it. <laughs> like, it's not going to be on your mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, you know, when we are, when we're saved, you know, a lot of times we use that word and we use it to refer to that single moment in time when we were converted, when we went from being a non-believer to a believer. Uh, where God regenerates our hearts, we're presented with the gospel, and we, we choose to follow Christ. And then at, at that point, the Bible says that we are justified before him. Well, this, you know, for some people that they can't point to like a single point in time, they can't go, well, somebody presented the gospel, and, and it was like, boom, I was saved, I got it, I, I believe. You know, for people like my wife, um, it was a slow progression sort of a thing. She can't point to a day and a time, but you know, she remembers when she didn't believe and she knows that now she does. And so God doesn't take us from um, a a non-regenerate state um, steeped in sin to an immediately glorified state. You know, even though the challenge here is sin no more, we're still in this body of flesh that still sins. And so um, that won't go away until we're on the other side of glory. And, that, and that's part of why when we talk about um, when either you die or Jesus returns and you're caught up and you're transformed in that instance, the Bible calls that being glorified. That means that you'll be removed from the presence of sin and all sin within you will be removed as well. You'll be perfected at that point. Well, that means that between now and then, you're stuck in this sinful body. And you're still presented with temptations. The difference, however, between someone who um, is a believer, someone who is regenerate, who has been saved, who is born again, and someone who is not, when you look at their life, it's what's the direction of their life. Uh, You will see that the fruit in their life is this constant growth in righteousness. And it's a little, I mean, we're talking baby steps, because the difference between my righteousness and God's is is so much that I'll never get there uh, in this lifetime. Um, but we're, we're talking like baby steps. So it's that, you, you know, you're headed in that direction and you may fall and, and God picks us up. Um, but that's, you know, the, the, the act of conversion and in, in salvation is a, is a sovereign thing. This is, it is initiated by God. It's completed by God, but the process of progressive sanctification is synergistic. It's you and the Holy Spirit working together. It's him uh, reminding you of your sins, pointing them out, convicting you of them, and then you saying, you're right, okay, I'm going to do something different this time. And now you're making new choices in agreement with the Holy Spirit as he teaches you in his word. So I'm glad that you said that because um, I don't want anybody listening to this to hear this challenge, sin no more, and go, well, I still sin all the time. Maybe I don't get it. Um, so that's that's perfect. You are asking such good questions today. This has generated really great discussion. I would say that, um, especially on that line of questioning about, you know, what is it a believer's response to sin look like? Um, you'll see some examples of that in the book Pilgrim's Progress. Now, it's an allegory. It's extra biblical, so don't go read it and and go, this is the Bible, but it does a really good job of painting word pictures and some of the conversations that the main character Christian has with uh, some of the other men and women along the way. I remember that there's one 
who has a lot to say about his response to sin and Christian keeps going, yeah, but you don't get it. it you know, he says, well, how should, how should I react when I see sin? Well, I should, when I see sin in other people, I should, uh, I should be disgusted by that. And Christian goes, no, when you see sin in yourself, you should be disgusted by that. And he goes, well, yeah, but that's not, that's not really that important. You know, those are the kind of conversations that they have in the book. So I would say, go read it. It's a, it's a fantastic read. Well, we're way over time and I want to be respectful of everybody's work day, but I'm super grateful that we had this opportunity to meet and spend time in the word. And thank you all for, for participating. And I love each of you individually, and I'm super bummed that we won't get to hang out at the retreat in person, but we'll just keep doing this. Uh, we'll do the best we can with what we got. So would somebody like to close us in prayer before we go? If not, I can. Well. You will? I will. I'm right. willing. I'm willing and eager. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me. There you go. <laughs> Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word. We thank you for providing it and for your gracious mercy that you have shown to us in Christ. Uh, it is a an inconceivably large gift, Christ's sacrifice on our behalf to take away the punishment we earned in our sin and to conquer death and hell and rise again from the dead that we might have life in him. And we ask you to grant us this life abundantly. We ask you to encourage us each day as you sanctify us and help us to resist sin Help us to hate sin as you do and turn from it and resist temptation. We ask you to uh, also make us bold and uh, true witnesses of your truth and beauty and goodness. We pray that you would enable us to lead lives uh, of repentance, above reproach, lives that other people look at and say, that uh, they want to know more and lives that direct others to your glory. And we pray that you will make opportunities clear to us to share your truth with others. We pray that you will help us to do so in encouraging ways and not condescending ways. Help us uh, to do so with the goal of bringing glory to you and not to us. And we ask you to comfort us also and your people as we continue to work through unsettled times in our country. And we ask that you will uh, again show us opportunities to uh, bring this stability and comfort to other people. And uh, we pray that you would use uncertainty and un instability to show people their need for a savior and we ask that in all of this, you would continue to bring glory to your name. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for coming. Thanks, Scott. Y'all have a good week. See you later. See you Bye. next time. Bye. Bye.